Good evening, everyone, and uh, I hope you are all doing great during this time. As we all know that uh, uh, Canada is uh, waiting for the federal election, which is coming very, very soon, September 20th. Uh, this federal election is very important because we've been through a very hard time during the COVID uh, two years, and uh, the, the governor general resolved the uh, parliament uh, and the minister, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, asked the uh, Governor General to recall the election uh, on the September 20th. Uh, this election is very important, as I said. Uh, so, in Canard TV, we are trying to uh, bring um, as much as we can from the candidates are running uh, into into in these elections to talk to them and ask them about the views, their own views, and the party views. Uh, I would like to call one of my dear, dearest friends, uh, Mr. Chandra Arya. Welcome, Chandra. Hello, Dr. Al Sharif. How are you? It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you so much for having me here. So, Chandra, many people around uh, Canada maybe don't know you personally. So, can you tell us who is Chandra Arya, your background before you started in politics? Yeah, you know, I can explain in detail, but simply speaking, my name is Chandra Arya. I'm the member of parliament for Nipian in Ottawa region. Uh, I'm a new Canadian, actually, maybe around 17, 18 years back, uh, I came to Canada with my family. Originally, I am from the South Indian city of Bangalore. I worked in the Middle East uh, for six years wow. in uh, Muscat uh, and uh, in Doha, Qatar before coming to Canada. My life, uh, you know, I have got engineering training. I have done my MBA. I started my life as an engineer. I was a banker. I had my own manufacturing company. I was an entrepreneur. I had my own manufacturing company. Done in the Middle East, helped many countries, all the six GCC countries, in fact, set up new manufacturing companies. Came to Canada. I was an investment advisor. Then I was in high tech as an executive. Now I'm in politics. This is what I am. Great. Tell me more about your family. Uh, do you have anybody with you, your wife, sure. your son? Yeah, we are a very small family in Canada. Me, my wife, and our only son. We're only three in entire North America. That is the reason I keep saying the community <laughs> is my family. Uh, my Our son is 29 years old. He is a chartered accountant. He works in Toronto as a manager at the Brookfield Asset Management. My wife used to work for Ottawa Catholic School Board. Once in a while, she still does the supply teaching, teaching English as second language, mostly to new immigrants. That's what we are. So I would like to ask you a question about your involvement within the community. But to tell you the truth, guys, wherever I go, I see Chandra. So uh, he's he's there always for, especially for uh, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, for celebration, festivals. Wherever we go, we find him. Tell me, Chandra, more about that. Why you love to do that? Okay. I usually joke. I don't have any business. I don't have extended families. I don't have any hobbies. I don't even golf. So that's the reason why I'm there. But seriously, <laughs> but seriously, you know, I'm the only ethnic community member of parliament from Ottawa. I want to promote the ethnic communities here. The visible minorities make close to 20 to 25 percent of Ottawa. But you have only one elected member of parliament. I want if the people can see me, meet me, get motivated so that they too can participate in the Canadian democratic system, so that we all can ha have our voice. We have come to Canada with different background, different ethnicity, different religious faith, different expertise, different intellect, different viewpoints. We have come here and Canada is our home today. So our varied thoughts, our varied thinking, should become part of the democratic Canadian democratic system. And if I can uh, 
at least motivate one two or three people especially the new generation that is one of the reasons why i proactively up go to the various ethnic community groups i think you succeed in that because we as we, as i said we see you not only in your riding but we see you everywhere and with the, with every community with every religious minorities so you are trying to be everywhere which is very hard and i know it taking your time and your family time uh, but that is highly appreciated in the community everybody talk you about, uh, about what you do highly man uh chandra uh, what why did you involved in canadian politics what is the motivation came uh, how did it start uh you know jamal that i'm fairly new to politics only about uh, six seven years back i decided to enter politics i was never in a member of any political party but as you know i was always involved with the community activities i was involved in so many different organizations not just limited to indo canadian organizations but other organizations like a not for profit housing corporation giving affordable housing to many people i was on the board of invest ottawa the economic development agency of the city of ottawa i was on the board of ottawa immigrant services organization so i was involved in the community for long time sometimes i used to think if you think this at the board room where the board of directors are coming in to discuss and make decisions me as a community activist i am standing outside the door advocating for the issues that are of interest to me i am telling them these are important issues when you go inside the board room please discuss and make decisions so i thought why should i stay outside and ask other people to decide why don't i come myself in and be the part of the decision making process so that was one of the major things obviously the things i was advocating outside the door was primarily three things one affordable housing for all i was always interested in you know when we first came to this country 17 18 years back jamal for two years we stayed in a in an up high rise apartment two bedroom one bathroom i mean we had our savings so we could afford to live there but i know the importance of affordable housing that every dollar we invest in affordable housing saves multiple dollars in other social cost including health cost that was the first the second secure retirement you know today in canada there are 11 million working canadians with no workplace pension plan let me repeat 11 million working canadians no workplace pension plan so when they retire many of them directly retire into poverty so i wanted to work towards the things that can secure their retirement so i am fairly successful on that the third is from the angle of our children and grandchildren you know the world economy is going towards a knowledge based economy and today canada is rich canada is prosperous because we have the natural resource of oil gas minerals yeah. forestry products agriculture we all have that that's the reason we are rich we are prosperous we have got high standard of living however the world is moving towards a knowledge based economy the advantages we have as a natural resources country is no longer to be available so i want canada to be at the forefront of this knowledge based economy so that we continue to be prosperous so that the standard of life that we enjoy today is also available to our children and grandchildren so these were the objectives with which i stepped into politics great
So why did you choose to join the Liberal Party? We know there we have several parties, strong parties in Canada. Liberal Party is one of them, and you chose it. Why did you? I come from a cultural background where we are socially liberal, fiscally conservative. Okay. To put it in very simple terms, my background is that on social issues, we are very, very liberal. But when it comes to financial issues, we are very conservative. Typical of us from the place we come from, other than the things like mortgage, we don't usually have any debt. We don't want to have any debt. We don't want to have credit card debt. At the same time, when it comes to the rights of the people of all different faiths, all different backgrounds, all different genders, the gender equality, the equal rights for gays and lesbians. So all this, we are socially very progressive. And it is the only party, the only party in Canada which has got both is the Liberal Party. Whereas the political parties in Canada, which are very far left, they don't have economically responsible policies. And the parties which are on the right, they are not socially liberal that can include everyone. And the Liberal Party being at the center made me an ideal place for me to look into, to get into, and I'm glad that I joined the Liberal Party. Yeah, that's great. So uh, running as a member of parliament, it's not an easy job, but the campaign, it's headache. I know you guys changing your shoes every 10 days because uh, too many doors knocking, uh, too many meetings. Uh, tell me about running a campaign in general. Uh, what do you need? How you do it? Uh, do you need volunteers? Do you need anybody to help or you can't do that by yourself? Yeah. Let me just... And, and by the way, Chandra, this is your third campaign, yes? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let me just step back. Let me go back to the first campaign, 2015. As I told you, I'm, I was new to politics. So I started doing research. Okay, what do I do? How do I become a candidate? Once I become a candidate, how do I run for election? There is no literature available. Like you and me, if we want to know something, we read on that subject matter first. But nothing is available in writing. Mm -hmm. Nobody can tell you what are the important things, how anybody can win an election, etc. My uh, research, or rather, you know, my, my conclusion based on all the research I've seen around says that there are five things that is required to win. Okay. Party, the leader, the election platform, the candidate, the sentiment during the election. Mm -hmm. So the leader party platform we cannot control. The sentiment during the elections we cannot control. That is the sentiments. The only thing under the control is me as the candidate. Me as the candidate, what is required is basically two things raise money, recruit volunteers. We okay. have to raise money. We have to recruit volunteers to do two things. Canvassing, phone banking. Fundamentally, these are the things. There are other small things like you have to buy the lawn signs put up. Maybe you have to advertise a bit on the Facebook. But fundamentally, get as many volunteers as possible. Knock as many doors as possible, call as many people as possible so that we know who are supporting us so that we can make sure the people who are supporting us come to the polling booth on the polling day. Okay, that is all the fundamentals about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's clear. And uh, I wish you all the best because you run two successful campaign and I think the third one will be successful. That's what I believe in. So Chandra, uh, the, the campaigns you are running is, uh, 
in a riding, uh, which we, we, we divide Canada into 338 ridings. Uh, your riding is Nepean. Tell me generally about this riding, how many people living in this riding. Uh, tell me about the Arab and Muslim in the ridings. Uh, what else we need to know more about this riding? Nepean riding is part of Ottawa. The total population is about 120,000. About uh, 85 to 90,000 are the voters. That is the overall size. Ethnically or demographically, 65 to 68 percent are white Canadians. 30 to 32 percent are ethnic minorities. Okay. Most of bulk of the people in the riding are Christians. Small percentage of them are Jewish. Another small percentage are Hindus. And there is a sizable Muslim population. I think around, in terms of the voting public, I think around six to 7,000, maybe seven to 8,000 are Muslims, which is also a very diverse crowd. The Muslims are here are from different parts of the world. They're from Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, Middle East, obviously, Africa. So all different ethnicities are there amongst the uh, Muslim population. Amongst the Arab population, bulk of them are Muslims. There's a small population of Arab Christians also here. So this is how the riding is. Politically speaking, the riding is pretty strong for conservatives. Okay. If you want to say, generally speaking, what is the composition of the conservative and liberal support here, I would put 30 to 35 percent of Nippian people vote conservative. Okay. 30 to 35 percent. 20 to 25 percent vote liberal. 8 to 10 percent typically vote NDP. Greens maybe 5 percent etc. So this is the general number. So obviously this is a conservative strong riding. All this percentage account for about 70% of the electorate. So the fight we have during the election is for the balance 30%. Where that bulk of the 30% goes, that candidate wins. Okay. In the last two elections, bulk of the 30% came to me, the liberals. That is why I won. So that is the political nature of this riding. So we are always conscious of the strong position of the conservatives in this riding. As you may be aware, this riding provincially is represented by a progressive conservative and federally have been representing for the last six years. So the 30% swing votes that is there, where do they go? It goes depending on the leader, party, platform, candidate, sentiments during the election. Yeah, that is that is very important and uh, very, you know, to bring it from conservatives to liberal. It's not an easy job and you've done it twice, I know, and I hope you can uh, do it the third time. So can you tell me more about the party, the liberal party? What is the... The, the, the plan or the priorities for the party in the coming uh, four years if, if you win the uh, government? Yeah. In the typical election, we could have said that, okay, this is what we are going to do for years. We are going to say that too. But fundamentally, this election is different. You know, when we first got elected in 2019, nobody expected pandemic. Nowhere in the world any elected government expected this pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, we had to take very hard decisions, monumentous decisions, huge decisions that fundamentally changed the way a government functions. We did not have mandate to do that, but because of the emergency of pandemic, we took those measures. We brought in great, many, big, big, big 
programs to help Canadians who lost their jobs. Nine million Canadians lost their jobs. We provided them the support so they can they put the food on the table and pay their bills. Hundreds and thousands of businesses were closing down. We supported more than half a million businesses, gave them the wage subsidy so that they can continue to employ their employees. So we took unprecedented steps. This election fundamentally is for two things. We, during the pandemic, thanks to the cooperation of Canadians, we are one of the best countries in the world in terms of vaccination. More than 82% of Canadians have been vaccinated. Eligible Canadians have been vaccinated as of today. So we are one of the best countries in the world. We are the best amongst all G7 and G20 countries. So we have come to a stage, up to this stage, thanks to the cooperation of all Canadians. Now, this election, we want Canadians to say two things. One, how do we go from here for the next, say, 15 to 20 months? Second, how do we go from here for the next 5, 10, 20 years? Trust me, things have changed. All the fundamentals that was there before the pandemic has changed, not only for Canada, but most countries in the world, it has changed. So we need to make decisions where to take Canada from here, how to take Canada from here. The decisions we are going to make today will affect us for 5, 10 and 20 years. And we need Canadians to have a say on that. Just to give one uh, very specific thing, pandemic opened our eyes to the needs of Canadians, the essential needs of Canadians. I am not talking just about the uh, vaccine manufacturing. That is one of the part. But what is that we have to do for self-reliance in terms of all the essential things we need? Luckily, we have agriculture. We have food grains. We have dairy. We have uh, egg chicken farming. We have the beef production. We are quite okay on that front. But when it comes to the healthcare products, for example, the vaccine or the personal production equipment and other critical things, we are still dependent on the imports. So we have to make fundamental change to how Canada, Canadian society, Canadian economy operates to address this. And that is the kind of say we want Canadians to have the say. And that is one of the reasons why we are having this election. Great. So, uh, Shandra, I will ask you several questions. Uh, or I will say some words. Let me know what do they mean for you and how you're going to uh, tackle them uh, if you become a member of parliament uh, in the next election. Uh, economy. Economy is the fundamental thing of any developed country. Period. Nothing else. Everything else comes later. First, the economy. The economy is defined mostly in terms of jobs. However, as I mentioned earlier, the economy is going from the earlier days of natural resources dependent, dependent on oil, gas, minerals, forestry products, we are going from that economy towards a knowledge-based economy. So for us, economy is the factor. What is that we are going to do? You know, people talk of jobs. Jobs have come back. But for me, it is not just the jobs have been created. But what is the kind of jobs that have been created that is interesting to me? You know, we can have 10 Amazons and 20 Walmarts and have lots of employment. But that is not my objective in terms of economy. I want in the knowledge-based economy, in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in automation, in battery manufacturing. So the advanced math or genomics, these are the kinds of jobs we need for our children and grandchildren 
we have to take action on the economy today so to that when our children grow up it is available for them to create a future for this absolutely generation. yep uh, housing i know this is very close to your heart yeah housing many times people get confused a lot thankfully the canadian home ownership is very high i don't have the exact number maybe around 60 to 65% of canadians own their home which is a good thing if you ask any home owner are you happy with the value of your house going up they will all say yes sure <laughs> right i have not heard anybody who owns a home saying oh my god the cost has gone no no they are not saying that however the remaining 30% is to be dicks that two parts for the remaining 35% who don't own home one part is the people who want to buy their own home and the second part who cannot afford to not only to buy but also cannot rent so there are two distinct components on affordability 65% canadian own home they are happy they pay their mortgages yeah, the good. interest rate is low value goes up they are happy but of the 35% one component the people who want to buy home that is usually the younger generation the first time home buyers so to make it affordable for the first time buyers we have brought in a scheme where the government gives you the first time home buyer 10% of the cost of the house okay 10% 10% okay and you have to just bring in another 10% and on the government that gives you 10% there's no interest rate okay all you have to do is that whenever you sell this house 3 years 5 years 10 years 20 you have to pay back the 10% of the value of the house back to the government Okay. If you sell for loss, that's okay. You still have to give the ten percent of the lower value of the house. So the scheme is there, and Jamal, the practical thing is many people don't want to take this facility. Strange. Because they think the value is going up. Why should I give my ten percent to the government? How? But then you should not complain. Yes, you're right. Because we are giving you ten percent. you are asking you to give only 10% just imagine when you i bought the house there was nothing like that 20% we had to bring from our own savings you have to be but for yourself. the new buyers we have this people are not taking so that is one part let me talk to the second part that yes, is the definitely. affordable housing the people as i told you many people uh, chandra have, i'm sorry Uh, I know, I know. This is very mixed uh, between the federal and pro, uh, and provincial. So, if you just can explain where is the parts, so people can okay. understand. Okay, on the people who want to buy, all three levels of the governments are involved: the federal government, the provincial government, and the city government. Most of the things regarding real estate is actually managed by the provincial government. Mm-hmm. At the federal government. we can influence the interest rate okay okay that is our major thing but we can also take steps like as i said we are giving all canadians across canada they can take 10% from the federal government and we are imposing taxes on the vacant property owned by the foreigners so whatever the limited thing the federal government can do we can do but to increase the supply of new homes it is the city and the province that is their responsibility yep. so that is one part of the 35% the people who don't have home the second part is the people who cannot buy their home nor they can even pay the rent many canadians have worked throughout their life they have retired they don't have enough income to pay the rent many canadians because of health reasons and so many other reasons they cannot afford to buy a home nor they can pay the rent that is the affordable housing we at the federal government have come with the most ambitious 
strategy and money we have put our money where our mouth is 55 million do- 55 billion dollars for the national housing strategy ottawa alone we have given hundreds of millions of dollars for ottawa alone for affordable housing in nipian in barhaven we have funded 98 brand new units of affordable housing for multi faith in bells corner at the christ church we have funded for the construction of new affordable housing for nipian headquartered uh, ottawa community housing we are giving 168 million dollars to renovate the old housing stocks 11700 housing units we are giving them to renovate we have given almost 150 million dollars to the private high rise builders so that they can build 30% of the new units for below market rents so we okay. have actually put our money where the mouth is that's great healthcare healthcare i know it's also mixed so things often. about canada is our healthcare nowhere in the world i can say that we can have the healthcare system that we have is the most beautiful fantastic system all you have to talk to anybody who has gone through the system they will tell you a cancer survivor or the people who had heart surgeries just talk to them you will know how beautiful the healthcare system is having said that we still have challenges in the healthcare the healthcare again is under the jurisdiction of the on the provincial governments however at the federal government every year we transfer money to the provinces for the healthcare five years back in addition to transferring regular amount plus in addition to transferring the extra amount we also transfer the third level of extra funding of 6 billion dollars with only two conditions spend that 6 billion on home care and for mental illness you know there was a study before i joined politics in ottawa and eastern ontario region 35% of the hospital expenses was consumed by 3.5% of the patients only yeah. 3.5% used 35% of the hospital expense 50% of the small number was seniors 30% of the small number were people mentally ill so we already did that now we are going one step further we are said we are going to provide 9 billion dollars so that we can have increased number of long term care homes for the seniors we can have more number of people coming into the healthcare system with increase in the minimum wage 25 dollars so we are doing all that oh i have understood also the government is trying to build manufactory for uh... Uh, vaccine and yeah. ppe which you, you spoke about okay yes. that's great uh islamophobia you know islamophobia we are the best country in the world no doubt about it but are we perfect no no we are we are not a perfect country the best thing about our country is we recognize the imperfections within us one of the imperfections we have is islamophobia we have islamophobia we have anti semitism we have the things like that which is not good for any society the good thing is what we are doing as a society the first thing is now almost every canadians recognizes that we have islamophobia that is the first biggest step you know we can you know my first private members bill when i was first elected every mp has got one chance in four years to pre- present one bill my first bill was on hate crimes it got passed now it's part of the criminal law so when it comes to islamophobia there are two ways we have recognized should do one the law 
we are introducing laws for the online hate. As I said, many laws we have formulated, including my private member's bill on the hate crimes. But the law is not enough. We need to educate Canadians on what Islam as a religion is. We need to bring that education from the young Canadians level. I will give an example. Today, whenever a kid or an young adult gets into a car, they put the seat belt. They put seat belt not because it is the law, because they have been educated that wearing seat belt is safety. So the same thing we had to come through education about the Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. We have to build that up from the, we should have a different level of education for the adult Canadians, for the seniors, but more importantly for the new generation of Canadians. I agree. Uh, Palestine, I know you advocated uh, for uh, Palestinian rights, Palestinian help from the UNRWA, and you personally visit Palestine, so please let me know what's your views on that. Yeah, Palestine is the one of the biggest failures of the entire world, including Canada. The entire world has seen the conditions of Palestinians every single day for the last over 70 years. Even today, two, three, four generations of Palestinians are living in refugee camps. Unacceptable. Everything we are trying to do, when they say we, Canada as a little, but the global community has not been able to move very firmly towards finding a solution. Several times we thought the solution was near, but it did not happen. And within Canada, the Canadian government has been very clear that we need a two-state solution, the state of Israel and the state of Palestine living peacefully next to each other. However, the main opposition party in Canada, the Conservative Party, have already recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Our view is that we cannot make that decision till the Palestinians and the Israelis sit and come to an agreement. That has not happened. As you know, before we came to power, all support to Palestinians was cost to zero dollars. Since we came to power, we have not only restored funding, we have been increasing funding to Palestinian refugee settlement through UNRWA or directly with, for the developmental projects. On the funding side, we have done quite much. We have also started changing our stand at the United Nations. As you might have seen, the strong statement from our foreign minister and our permanent ambassador in the, at the United Nations, we have already taken firm stand yet. But personally, I want much more to be done by Canada. In my view, Canada, we should lead the way, not follow the what our friends do. We should lead so that our friends will follow us. So it is a work in progress. That's all I can say. The truth and reconciliation with the indigenous people. And that is the most important thing for Canada. We have recognized all the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We have implemented it almost every single. We have got two great ministers. We cannot find better Canadians than the two ministers, Mark Miller and Caroline Bennett, handling these facts. They have been the advocates for indigenous peoples for long, many years, even before they became ministers. They work hand in hand with the indigenous people directly without any intermediaries. We have taken enormous steps jointly with the indigenous communities. Every single thing we have done, we have always done jointly with them. And we have made tremendous progress, but still there's much more thing to do and we are doing it. Systemic racism. Ah, you know, 
when people say there is no systemic racism we know that is not right but is canada a racist country no you know people say canada is a racist i totally vehemently disagree on that canada is not a racist country but do we have systematic racism yes we do have systematic racism you know as a visible minority as a person of color i have seen this happen on the parliamentary too but i don't usually make a big issue out of it but those things remind me that racism is still systematic i joined the black caucus you know the parliamentary black caucus the mps who are interested on the issues of black canadians we have a small group from day one i was part of it through that black caucus we have done so much of work and lot of those things have been formed turned into a policies that is being implemented have we solved systematic systemic racism no it is a cancer that cannot be solved by one injection or one pill this is a treatment that we have to keep doing over and over and over again so one day canada the best country will the world will become the most ideal country in the world great so uh, what is your message for canadians who gonna uh, vote on the day on the september 20th especially those in your riding my thing is think before you vote because the vote is the most valuable fundamental right we have as canadian citizens i agree it whatever we are as a country today what we will we will be as a country tomorrow everything is dependent on one single vote of you and mine so every single vote will determine where we go from here how we go from here what is the country we are today and what is the country we want tomorrow think on that fundamentally strategically think on two things what is that we need for the next 15 to 20 months what is that we need for the next 5 10 20 years we which is the best candidate to represent you think that and put your ballot great so i just want to remind everybody that really one vote can make difference and it happened in canada in many occasion we've seen a winner one with only one vote difference so please 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 on september 20th go and vote uh, for the party you believe in for the candidate you believe in but just practice your rights uh, as chandra says this is the most valuable rights we have people fight in other countries just to be able to vote and put somebody in power they trust or they believe in so uh, we have it on on a plate of gold as they say but i would like to emphasize uh, on chandra's needs on his campaign volunteer these days are very very important to help with phone calls with door knockings with putting signs if you can't volunteer go and pick up your sign and put it in front of your door or friend's door and for sure uh donation uh i would remind i know that chandra didn't uh, spoke a lot about it but donation is very important for any uh candidates and the the federal government is giving very important incentives if uh 75% back of $400 so basically if you donate any amount up to 4 400 you get $75 uh, 75% which is 300 of the 400 in your pocket bag so this is a very good incentive and finally but the most important is to vote on the election day uh chandra i would like to thank you on behalf of our, our audience on behalf of myself and canar tv wish you all the best and uh, i know that you are running a very clean and nice campaign uh hope uh, we'll see you in the parliament soon john thank you
Uh, again, I would like to thank Chandra and thank all our audience. Uh, hope to see you next week with another candidate. Uh, enjoy your days and enjoy the rest of your uh, 